Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Happy Friday. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Uh, this week on the show, we talked about the South Sea bubble after a two year procrastination slash resource delay on my part that worked out in my favor because I really liked the resources I found on the second attempt more than on the first attempt. I feel like anytime I put something off, the resulting episode always comes out better, whether it's because resources have arisen or I've just like, in the background, my brain has been kind of creeping around the topic and processing it and thinking about it in ways. So I'm glad you waited two years. Yeah, um, I am too. I don't, uh, there are a couple of disciplines. Like there is uh, writing meant for a more general audience that I can find very accessible and I can wrap my head around the language that they use in their framing. But I have occasionally found myself in something that is really written for within that discipline, and I'm like, I don't know what you are talking about. Uh, One of them is economics. There were a couple of uh, older, not older, I mean older as of 2019 or early 2020 when I was looking at this, uh, where I was kind of like, I don't know what you're saying. Weirdly, another one, sociology. There have been a couple of times when I have found a sociology paper that was about the subject that I was trying to research, and I tried to read it and was like, there's just a whole vocabulary here that, that, you know, having taken sociology 101 in college as part of my general education requirement, I'm like, I don't, I don't know, I don't, these are concepts, they're words for concepts, I don't have any of this framework. And then I thought, I second-guessed myself, I'm like, am I just a mess? And so I asked my friend who's a history teacher and was like, has this ever happened to you? And she said, yes, I have seriously considered like taking a couple of classes because there's often overlap between history and sociology and I will get into deep sociology weeds and not know what's going on. So I'm glad I was able to find some things where I knew what was going on. Um, I also kept thinking about stuff like Beanie Babies. (laughs) Uh, And like, whatever nifty new thing people have going on that are glommed on to about trying to invest in, going to make a bunch of money real fast, but it's really a lot more like a Ponzi scheme. Thought about doing a Ponzi episode, maybe do that later. Yeah. I mean, the trick, right? Here's the thing. There are people that make a lot of money really fast in those schemes, but they're usually people that had a lot of money to begin with. Like, they're just augmenting their ridiculous wealth. And the people that actually could really use a financial bump, usually get the short end of the stick. Yeah. Well, and that was the case with the South Sea Bubble, too. A lot of the people who were the loudest and the most outraged were either people whose losses were not real money that they ever had. It was the money they didn't get because they didn't sell at the right time. So the price had gone from roughly where they bought it back to roughly where they bought it and they just not get, did not get that tenfold increase. They saw it mad. And, you know, I've. it's not like I have a giant investing portfolio, but I have been in positions where I like, had an employee stock purchase program or something. Uh, and I've sort of seen, well, this used to be worth this many dollars, <laughs> but now it's worth way fewer dollars. Um, at one point earlier in my career, uh, I we got like uh, I got shares as like part of my compensation, um, and then they were worth less than they had been worth when they were given to me as part of my compensation. And I was like, "This is this is weird. I don't really appreciate that at all." Uh, but then the other thing about the people who were the loudest about their losses in the South Sea Company. A lot of them were people who were already rich. And so, yes, they had lost a lot of money, and that would suck. But they were still rich, <laughs> and they still had a lot of money. Right. Their their livelihood was in no way in danger. Yeah, yeah. And that was not the case for everyone. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the, the ordinary middle-class folks who lost their whole savings or who subscribed at the wrong time and then were on the hook for something they couldn't afford anymore, like, that was, a, a, like, I think a, a 
more immediate problem in a lot of lives than the person who was really rich and lost a lot of rich people money and still had a lot of rich people money, but were mad about the money they didn't have anymore. Yes. <laughs> I found myself thinking a lot about the housing bubble and the whole... Yeah. Invest in a home. We will loan. We will make a loan work for you. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And it wasn't. It hasn't been yeah. fine for everybody. Yeah, I I know people that bought their homes really at the peak of that, like, pre-collapse housing bubble. Uh, I bought a home not at the peak, but nearer to it, but as a short sale, and I thought I was getting an amazing deal. Uh, but then I owed way more money than the house was worth, and I that was not great. Um it was not something that affected me until I tried to sell the house and was like, uh, I need more money to pay off the bank than I can get if I sell this. And, yeah. Uh, that was a giant mess. <laughs> yeah, that's no fun at all. I definitely have a lot of friends that were in that same boat where it was like, oh, my house is worth half of what I owe on it. Yeah. It's not a yeah. fun place. No. Well, and especially when... Other stuff happened as a result, and in this at the, the at the same time as the housing bubble collapsed. So, like you know, people who then also lost their jobs and like couldn't pay couldn't pay their astronomical mortgage payments anymore, and then also couldn't get out from under their house because you know they owed a lot more money on it than they could get if they sold it. It's bad, bad scene all around. Yeah, not good. Bubbles. Um, I did not realize that the word bubble to refer to such an event went back so far. That seemed like a very 20th century jargon thing to me, but no. Yeah, there, there. I found several sources that said this was the first use of bubble, but, you know, Oxford English Dictionary disagrees with the people who put that in their article. Um, it does seem like it became a lot more popular terminology. Um, we didn't mention it, but people also could still remember the uh, the tulip mania bubble that was not long enough ago in the past that it had fallen out of public memory or anything. So some of the uh, some of the artwork, like the satirical artwork about the South Sea bubble, was just tulip mania bubble with the names changed, um, <laughs> which I found pretty hilarious. I feel like we should mention the irate making whole thing of like no no you dumb dumb people shouldn't be playing with money what do you think yeah. you're doing yeah yeah. Oh. yeah there was a lot of really sexist commentary about women it was women's fault women should not have been investing women don't know how to invest women made this problem and then again the whole thing was uh, underpinned by a slave trading venture yeah um no. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I've got is growling. <laughs> yeah, the, there were a couple articles that I read along the way where I was like, you know, this was slavery, right? Like, this was was not like they were shipping, I don't know, uh, locally grown wool. There might have been some locally grown wool, but that was not the major part of what the South Sea Company mm-hmm. was trading. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Bubbles. Get rich quick schemes. Real frustrating. Yeah. We talked about Moms Mabley this week. Yes, we did. Uh, I've enjoyed watching so much of her comedy as YouTube videos, listening to some audio clips from various albums, stuff like that. And boy... Did I spend a lot of time just trying to find out for sure what happened to all of her children? Uh, I became way more invested in this <laughs> than than I typically do on unanswered questions on the show. And there was a lot of like trying to search through vital records from Transylvania County, North Carolina, which is where Brevard is, and Buncombe County, North Carolina, which is where Asheville is. Uh, and then also just having questions about how carefully either of those communities were recording births of Black children uh, during these years. And it frustrated me uh, <laughs> not to be able to find some more definitive answers. Um, 
because it's like it, whatever is the answer, clearly traumatic uh, situation. Right. To to either have had uh, two children who were placed for adoption, seemingly not really with uh, with her having a lot of agency over that and never seeing them again, or whether she had four total children and two of them disappeared when the people whose care they had been left in disappeared and she didn't get to reunite with them until adults. Like, all all of the possible scenarios, I'm like, all of these have layers that are tragic and upsetting. Yeah. And less tragic parts of her story. How did she get on your radar? Do you remember the first time you saw Moms Mabley? So the first thing that I really remember is that uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel episode. Oh! It's totally possible because some of the old variety shows that she was on used to be syndicated on Nick at Night or little clips of them would run on things like Comedy Central uh, when I was a kid. We were not early adopters for cable at all. I'm not even sure when cable first became an option out in the country where we lived. So, like, it's totally possible that I saw comedy clips and they just did not stick in my memory until I watched The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and was like, I'm pretty sure Wanda Sykes is playing a real person here and I need to go find out who that is because I am intrigued. How about you? Carol Burnett. Oh, yeah. I think I remember it distinctly. I remember seeing her on Carol Burnett when I was tiny. I'm still pretty sure it was a rerun, but, like, that was before things like Nick at Night existed. Uh Uh-huh. And then also seeing her on Flip Wilson. Oh, yeah, okay. Because I am one of those people, again, I was a small child, who thought it was a man in drag. Uh Uh-huh. And I remember my parents being like, I don't think that is, because I was like, is that a guy? And they were like, I don't think it is. But may I don't know. Like they were very yeah. like, well, I don't know what you're asking about, kid. Well, and enough adults had the same question that when I was really just pouring through old newspaper articles, trying to find as much about her as I could, I found multiple, you know, ask the columnist columns right. where people were like, Is mom's Mabley a man or a woman? And then I didn't make this point in the in the episode, but maybe I should have. I think even in addition to the fact that I think she would have been more famous among white people had she been white, that's obvious. I also think there would have been a biography of her. Oh, yeah. Written either while she was still living or shortly after her death when a lot of these questions would have been easier to research because there would have been more people alive who would still know the answers. And, like, there's no, like, there's not a a Moms Mabley Papers collection in existence that at least that I was able to track down. And uh, other people of her influence, especially if they were white and especially if they were men, did have all of that. So, yeah, I... (laughs) Uh, I'm I'm glad she's getting like tiny bits uh, of more recognition, sort of trickling out through things like that. Uh, the play from the '80s that we talked about, and although I think that might be the source of the thing about her mother being killed shortly after her father's death, like I feel like some of the things that are multiple conflicting accounts have been picked up from there. Um, but it's like it's hard to trace because a lot of people have printed things in their reporting without saying where they where they learned it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm literally just thinking about her and laughing. Yeah. You and I both do the thing where we, like, just tell our spouse the whole thing that we've been researching. And so we were eating dinner, and I was talking about Mom's Mabley, and Patrick got out his phone and started looking at Mom's Mabley videos during dinner. Uh, and she had one, and I'm not... I I I think uh, the double entendre filled things that we actually said in the episode, I feel like probably would just fly over the heads of younger listeners. And if you have had to have awkward questions with your children this week, sorry. Um, so, but I'm not going to repeat this particular one. She she gave this joke that was just delivered with amazing timing, and that like there was a pause, and Patrick went, "That was a very dirty joke." Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Listen, I love a filthy joke, so... Yeah. I love how she used her platform for activism without skipping a beat. Yeah, yeah, that for sure. And also her, like, social satire stand-up and her very pointed 
social commentary and critique, like that genre of stand-up, she was really a front runner in. Uh, like one of the first people who was really doing that and and making use of this very disarming character to be able to say things that other people probably couldn't get away with. Um, one thing that I didn't get into in the episode because I just couldn't figure out how to how to work it in is that, that there's there's been a lot of conversation about her uh, her sexuality and her like her presentation of her gender and that kind of stuff. And I read one paper that traced several jokes about gay men in some of her comedy albums. And the person who wrote the paper was making the argument that, like, this was clearly her laughing with people and not at them. But in reading the jokes, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I have the same opinion on that read. Right. Um, and it could go either way. I don't really know the answer. But um, it is clear that she had some jokes uh, in her set that involved gay men uh, in the era before, like, before Stonewall, mm-hmm. before there was, as uh, like, as much cultural visibility. But still, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I were listening to that joke and it were about me, <laughs> how I would feel about that. Yeah, I mean, I, um, th- I feel like that's always the caveat anytime we talk about any performer that is... yeah. Uh, from an earlier time, I imagine in today's world, she would be making different jokes. Oh, for like, sure. I think she for specifically sure. would feel differently about the issue and be making yeah, different yeah, jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I it that makes it very, very interesting that um, Wanda Sykes, who is an out lesbian woman, mm-hmm. was comfortable playing her. That's not the same yeah. thing as being. You know, the entire LGBTQ community is not a monolith, and that's not the same as how a gay man might feel about sure that material. But it does offer a little bit of an insight into how, even through the modern lens, she's perceived. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and people have have interpreted uh, her life in in a, several different ways. There are people who have described her as lesbian, and people who have described her as bisexual, and wherever you want to fall in that interpretation, it's clear that offstage she was just living her life as who she wanted right. to be as an adult. So, uh, you know, she's uh, clearly is a life that uh, with all of the line blurring with gender and sexuality is like in the queer history umbrella. Yeah. Where within that umbrella people want to specifically go, like I feel like there's room for interpretation. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like that is really the paper I would love to read if there were better records, is someone examining her, whether it was very consciously done or just seemed natural to her and was not a pointed thing, her kind of rejection of the the gender binary and just being like, no, I'm fluid. I'm, I am who I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm mom's. Yep. Like, I, I love the nickname Mr. Mom's. It's so sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it's just kind of an interesting, an interesting piece that I wish we had more actual details of. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even a lot of the folks that were not everyone, some some of the folks that were interviewed in that uh, in that documentary who gave those insights are no longer no longer with us. So, uh, anyway, I uh, have said this twelve times now. I think I love Bob's Mabley. <laughs> I loved having a reason to stop what I was doing and watch stand-up on YouTube. (sighs) May we all laugh as much as possible. And I'll just also just, like, live our own lives. Yes. (laughs) How we want to do it. Uh, If you want to send us an email, we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. We'll be back tomorrow with Saturday Classic and Monday with a brand new episode. We hope whatever's going on for you this weekend that it goes well. And we'll talk to you again soon. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 